In this final example, I wanted to talk very quickly about arrays of clusters. Now we've talked about this already, but I wanted to demonstrate the benefits of the polymorphic nature of most of LabVIEW's functions and controls and indicators. In particular, in this case, we want to talk about the polymorphic nature of the 1D sort function within LabVIEW. Let's first take a look at what we have on the front panel here. Here we have an array of clusters. And inside the cluster are three values. First, there's a numeric temperature. There's a username, which is actually a string. And there's another numeric, which is the measurement number. If we take a look at the code behind this, it's based on the exact same structure as the previous example. In this example, however, the generate event case does not create a 2D array of numbers. In this case, it's creating 10, as we can see from the 10 wired into our, our count, loop counter of the for loop. And each time this for loop runs, it's creating a new element which is going into the array. And that element is being bundled together, containing a temperature, a measurement number, and a username. Because we're just creating some simulated data, we're using here the OpenG random number within range function, which is an extension of the standard LabVIEW random number generator in that it allows you to specify the high and low range. So in this case, I'm simulating temperatures between 18 and 100 degrees. Our measurement number, which is just the loop counter plus one. And again, we're using that same function, this time with a little bit of extra numeric manipulation afterwards, to choose an index from these array of usernames. So we're creating essentially a random username between Joe, Bob, and Mary by pulling it out of that array. So when we go back to our front panel and we run this, this time we do generate, we've created a series of random temperatures, random usernames, and measurement numbers ranging from 1 to 10. So again, the, the, the key function of this VI is in the sort by case. And this time, where our sort by is actually, instead of just a Boolean, we're actually using an enum. So we take a look at that enum, we see it's got a few different values. It's got temperature, user, and measurement number. So essentially what we're doing here is we're allowing multiple ways to sort this data. Whereas before we had a numeric control to select which column or which row we wanted to sort by, now we have to handle each different type of sort slightly differently. So that's why we have a case structure. And in order to select how we want to sort it, we're using the enum. So let's first look at sorting by measurement number. So we have two for loops here and a sort in the middle. What we're leveraging here is the polymorphic nature of this sort 1D array. It can sort a 1D array of anything. So let's take a close look at what we've done here. We've taken our data which is coming through here. These are our 10 clusters which have been put together into an array. And inside, just turn off the context help, what we're doing is we're first unbundling by name and we're taking off the measurement number. Then we're taking the rest of that cluster. So if we were to turn on the context help of this wire right here, we'd see that it's a cluster of two elements. First is the numeric measurement number, and second is the element. And that element itself is the original cluster which contains the temperature, the user, and the measurement number. The reason we're doing this is because when we put this information together in a bundle and we build an array of it, as we're doing with the auto-indexing terminal here, then when we put that array into the sort, it's going to sort by the first element in the cluster. In other words, the whole purpose of doing this is to feed something into the sort function where the first element of this new cluster type is the measurement number. Because in this case, we're sorting by measurement number. So once this guy has done its sorting, the output here is the data type of exactly the same type, but it's been sorted so that the first elements are in ascending order. The second step of the process is to loop through that data which has just been sorted and to take out that redundant information. We don't need that second copy of the measurement number. All we need is the element information. So we do an unbundle, we discard the first element by not connecting it to anything, and that second element is connected out and back into our shift register. So once this event structure case is finished, the data array will be updated. So that was a lot of explanation. Let's just watch it work. So if we were to select to sort it by temperature, we see that the array has been reordered so that temperature is indeed ascending, but it's kept the username and the measurement number which belongs to each record. So we can resort this by measurement number or by user. So this is a very powerful concept, this idea of being able to bundle together some value with the full element of the cluster which you previously had 
putting that into an array, and then sorting by that first element. One of the downsides is you notice that we have a case structure here. In this case, which we just investigated was the measurement number, there's also uh, has to be a separate case for each different data type. So user and temperature require their own special handling. And the reason for that is the data type of this array here is not the same as the data type here. Because the bundle is creating a new data structure, each of these different types of sorts must be handled in their own case. But the good news is that they look very similar. And in fact, just by duplicating and changing the element which you're choosing here in the unbundle by name, you can easily make modifications. So in this installment, we've talked about arrays of clusters of things. We've talked about these more complicated data structures within LabVIEW, and I hope that I've managed to motivate the need for them and maybe de demystified them a little bit for you, and also shown you a few tips and tricks that will allow you to leverage creating your own data structures in the future. Thank you very much for listening and watching. Um, as always, we welcome any comments or questions. Um, please feel free to post any of those below. I also wanted to quickly mention the U.S. FIRST Robotics Competition. You can take a look at it at usfirst.org. This year is a particularly interesting year for the FIRST Robotics Competition because for the first time, all of the controllers are Compact Rio controllers, which of course is a National Instruments product. And as a result, all of these teams are going to be using LabVIEW, many of them for the first time, to program their robots. This is a tremendous opportunity for the LabVIEW community to get together and help by personally volunteering at a team um, in your area. I also wanted to quickly mention a special offer we have at LV Mastery related to the FIRST Robotics Competition. We're allowing mentors, teachers, and parents of kids participating in the competition to purchase access to all three of our courses at the special academic price of $500. And for each seat purchased, we're also going to donate a seat to your team. Please feel free to check out lvmastery.com first for more information. Thank you very much for watching. Bye for now.